try this one more time. I'm <laughs> so sorry about that. Take two. Thank you for joining. I'm Randy Robinson. This is Life Today Live, and we got a hot topic today. It is the topic of racism. Now, I am going to assume, I think correctly, that most of you watching are Christians. I don't need to convince you that racism is bad, that it's wrong, that it's completely the opposite of what Christ stood for. Uh, I can go through example, uh, you know, examples in the scripture, um, but I, I, I'm going to assume that that's not necessary. Let me just put it this way. If, if you believe that racism is acceptable, uh, a good thing, uh, okay as far as Christianity is concerned, you're completely deceived. You do not understand the Bible. You need to go read the Bible. All you got to do is read it, and you'll figure out, okay, racism was something that Jesus actually kind of stood against very directly. So my question is, how do we in the church deal with racism? How do we confront it? How do we make things better? This has been a burden in our country since its founding. Our founding fathers knew it. In fact, they wrote the Constitution and the Bill of Rights in such a way that slavery could not stand. Uh, and then, you know, f fighting for another hundred years to get rid of the Jim Crow laws and things like that. So this is an ongoing issue. It's a burden that the church must address. And I think the church should be the leaders in our culture against it. And I recognize that in, in most ways, the church has been. I mean, all the way from the Underground Railroad going through churches, to the civil rights movement um, playing out in churches. Uh, the church overall has been very much against racism. Obviously, you can go find one-off examples, uh, and there has been um, what we would call a soft racism sort of in a, in a lot of churches that just has got to go. We got we to figure out if there's any of it left and get rid of it. So how do we confront racism? How do we lead on this issue? Okay, we're going to hear from a gentleman uh, named Miles McPherson. He's the pastor of Rock Church in San Diego. Uh, former NFL football player, drafted by the Rams, spent most of his four years with the San Diego Chargers. Um, he was born in Brooklyn, New York, raised out in like Long Island. Um, and he's, he's not just biracial, he's multiracial. So he's dealt with this from a very interesting perspective um, all of his life. And now he has a multi-ethnic church in San Diego, uh, and he speaks out on it. And, and he has a book called The Third Option, and so when you, you hear him referencing the book, that's what he's talking about. Uh, he came here to, to talk about the book. We get a lot of people coming through here when they have a book that comes out. It, it kind of helps anchor the message. Uh, and, of course, they're, on the, they're taking time to promote the book. So that's one of the reasons they'll come here. Uh, but I'm not going to sell you the book. You're going to have to go find it on your own if you're interested. Um, what I'm interested in are the ideas in the book because they're really good. Um, and uh, so let's set the stage here, and then we'll, we'll, we'll go through some points. I've got four. Oh, I've got five, don't I? Did this last night, and, and then I slept, and then my brain half erases itself. I've got five points, five things that we can do as Christians to combat this scourge of racism. Here's Miles McPherson. Yeah, racism is a hot topic today. Uh, in my lifetime, it's never been so vocally, overtly divisive. Mm -hmm. And so a couple of years ago when I started writing this book, um, I kept saying, it's got to come out now, it's got to come out now. And it kept getting worse and worse and worse. <laughs> so it's yeah. the perfect time. Uh, background, I, I am mixed. Obviously, my grandmother's white and I have another half black and half Chinese grandmother. And then my grandfathers were black. So I, I'm mixed with black, white, and Chinese. I grew up in a black neighborhood and got harassed because I wasn't black enough. Mm. Went to school in a white neighborhood, got harassed because I wasn't white. But I played on football teams with black and white guys who got along. So I knew that, obviously, you know, it wasn't all bad, but you heard the good, the bad, and the ugly of people, mm. but also the good. And a lot of my dearest friends were on both sides of the tracks, almost literally, mm -hmm. talking about each other mm -hmm. because they didn't understand each other, but I understood both sides. And now that I pastor a church that is like the United Nations and, you know, thousands of people, I know people can get along. God created us to get along. Mm -hmm. And in every race conversation, it's about us versus them. You kind of pick to choose a side. And every if you watch the news and 
whether it be the NFL controversy, the political controversies, the police controversy, yeah. you're always forced to pick a side against another side. Those are your two options. Mm -hmm. The third option is that we honor what we have in common. And you and I were made in the image of the same God. Mm -hmm. You want to have a family, you want to have fulfill your dreams. We're 99.5% genetically identical. Mm -hmm. So we are more similar than different. Yeah. But we always focus on what's different mm -hmm. because we're told that. So this book is designed to give people tools on how uh, they can foster that honor between uh, people who don't look like them, who have nothing, nothing in common with them, so they think. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is recognize that racism is an issue. Being in denial does not help. Uh, you may think, I I'm not a racist, and you probably aren't. Um, but there's still a lot of things going on out there in people's minds, and in, in the culture, in society. So we first have, have to recognize that it's, it's real. Now, don't fall for the false choice. The, it's either black or white, and I don't mean that in strictly racial terms. It's either this way or this way. You either believe this or you believe that. That's what Miles is talking about with his third option. We have to proclaim that Christ loves everyone. Equality in the sense that uh, God loves us and treats us, uh, in a sense, equally. Granted, there's favor when you come into Christ, but it's from the creation to the cross, from the very stamp of God on his creation, mankind, his image, the Imago Dei I like to talk about. That was there, and it goes through the redemption of Christ. He died for everyone. He died for the sins of the world. That's everybody. So from that standpoint, there is not one greater than another. God loves all all of us. I, I don't like saying God loves us equally. God loves us fully. God's full love is on all of us, from his original intention to Christ's universal redemption. It's for everyone. There is no color. There is, Paul says there's no Jew or Gentile in Christ. There's no male or female. That doesn't mean we lose that. I, I don't like the term colorblind in the sense that I like to see someone's color. I think that diversity is, is beautiful, but there's strength in unity, not in diversity. There's beauty in diversity, but strength in unity. Uh, you're not supposed to even ask. I, I, I learned a little bit late in the game. I was in Denver in a cab, and um, the, the guy was black, and the driver was black, and I get at the airport, and he's like, you know, where, were, where are you going or whatever? With some kind of accent, okay? Obviously an African accent. Well, that piques my curiosity. I've been to Africa many times. And so I told him where I was going, and I said, where are you from? Uh, I, I've heard more recently that that is what's called a microaggression. You're not supposed to, a white person is not supposed to ask someone who's not white where they're from. Stupidest thing ever. <laughs> um, he said he was from Mozambique. I'm like, oh, my gosh. I've been to Maputo, I've been to Baira, I've been to some villages out in the middle of nowhere. So we had this long, because I had about a 45-minute drive, discussion about Mozambique, about how he got over here to the United States, how he likes Denver. I mean, we had a great conversation. There, were, it, it was actually, I thought it was very nice. I think he did too. I tipped him well at the end of the drive. Um, and so, you know, that was a door opener to a conversation, and that's what I think we need is more door openers to conversations, you know. And here's the thing. If I had come at him with the attitude, you know, hey, yeah, where are you from, versus a curiosity about the person, which is what it was, it would have been a whole different ballgame. So it's not in the question. It's, it's in the attitude behind the question. You come at someone with love, well, even if you stumble a little bit here, their love covers a multitude of sins of missing the marks, you know. You don't have to be perfect when you come at someone with love. That is the better option. Um, let me go back to Miles, and he's going to bring up uh, some more points because we can, we can be the leaders, and we should be. And one other point about dealing with racism, you're not going to change the culture. Most of us, I mean, we don't have a voice loud enough to change the culture. Even the loudest voices have a hard time changing the entire culture. You can change yourself, your outlook, in a healthy way. 
and then you can change those around you. That's what we need to learn to do. Here's Miles McPherson again. I know as, as divisive as our culture is, I believe the devil has overplayed his hand mm -hmm. and that people are tired. I have had nothing but positive reception because people want to heal. They want to get along. People are tired of the division. They're tired of the, and the fighting and the tension and the us first them mentality. And so the, the reception to the book and to the message of the book has been overwhelmingly positive. Okay. And, and what's ironic is that people from black, white, Hispanic all have the same exact reaction f verbatim. Everybody needs to hear this. <laughs> we, <laughs> you know, because yeah, yeah, yeah. we want to get along. And I, I want to give the country hope because, I, you know, if you watch television, you have to understand television, um, the media, it makes their money on division. Yeah. And so as long as we're fighting, they make money because there's mm -hmm. story, there's drama. Mm -hmm. But we don't have to fight. We don't have to play into it. All right. Don't believe the hype, right? The media likes to stir up trouble. And frankly, the loudest voices oftentimes on this thing are the troublemakers. Don't fall for that. Look for common ground. That's my second point. Look for common ground. Don't be afraid to make a few mistakes. Don't be put off by a suspicious reaction or even a hostile reaction. Just keep pouring on the love, the kindness, the gentleness, right? The fruit of the Spirit. Look for that common ground. We have more in common than we have uh, not in common. I mean, you know, they say beauty's only skin deep, but ugly goes to the bone, right? <laughs> we need to get past the skin, and we need to get past the ugliness and just get to the heart of the matter. Just reach out. Be nice to somebody, regardless of their race. Don't be patronizing. Just be nice. And, and you know, really, if we're, if we're Christian as we should be, if we behave uh, as we should in the sense, and by the way, the behavior, you only get the fruit when you got the root, okay? So don't try to grow fruit when your roots aren't deep enough. Get grounded in the Word of God and let the Holy Spirit bring forth the fruit. You'll find this happening. Don't let fear control you. And that's one thing I don't like about a lot of the movement that is uh, against racism, it, it creates this whole other level of fear. I mean, you, you're uh, at least uh, from the standpoint of a white person, and that's 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 my perspective. Um, you're like, man, I'm afraid to talk to anybody. I might say the wrong thing. But just keep pressing with the love. Keep pressing in with the love. Don't pull back because of fear. Find the common ground. Chat is open. I appreciate all you guys out there watching on all these different places. And I point that out because I'm going to ask you to do something here in a minute where I'm going to need a response. By the way, if you think that this conversation is helpful, please share it. Um, I, I think this is something that we need to hear. That's why I'm taking the time to do it. And, and so if you would share it across your social platforms, we can help get the word out that racism is something that we can overcome in this country. We've overcome some awful things, and, and we, can, we can finish the race. In the U.S., in Canada, in Europe, wherever you're at, we can be what Christ wants us to be, which are leaders. Now, again, part of that requires some introspection, okay? Recognize there's a problem. Look for common ground. Here's some more great insight from Miles McPherson. Trust me, there is a lot of racial division in the country, and there is a lot of um, uh, um, anger and resentment. But I believe that people, if they get in the room and they look at each other and they say, are you good? <laughs> <laughs> Can yeah. we be good? Yeah. I, I saw a picture the other day. It was a group of white supremacists and black protesters, um, uh, a group of black men uh, protesting whatever they were, they were uh, against each other. When I say against each other, they were physically meshed with each other, but in the very middle was a white guy and a black guy hugging each other. <laughs> and the caption said, why do you hate me? <laughs> and it was so encouraging yeah. because they, was, they were making a statement, mm -hmm. we don't have to do this. Yeah. Um, I think the biggest, biggest aha I got right in this book, which is probably needs to be really understood by your viewers, is that even though there are some people who are racist, most people will say they're not. 
But the truth of the matter is the third option is that we're all biased. Mm -hmm. And that you can be racially offensive and not be a racist. This is very, very important because people a lot of times can't separate those two things. If I offended you, that must mean I'm a racist. Mm -hmm. And no, you, you could offend me out of complete ignorance, mm -hmm. uh, innocence, and you're nervous. You, you said something that you were taught was innocent, but, it, but someone took offense to it. And because if people can't separate being racially offensive to being a racist, they will never admit they're offensive. Mm -hmm. Therefore, they'll never learn. Mm -hmm. Therefore, they'll keep doing what they do. Mm -hmm. And they won't ever be able to get into a dialogue with someone mm -hmm. about how to change because mm -hmm. they don't think they have to change. People can be racially, all of us, I was talking to someone here in Texas, who we were here in Dallas, and this woman was from East Texas, and she had an accent oh. like that, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, right? And I was teasing her. It's, you know, she's 87 years old, so we were just joking around accents. Right. She could have taken offense. Now, I don't believe she did, she, but she could have easily been offended by that. That wasn't my intent. Yeah. And so we say things and we do things that someone might take an offense, and if we can accept that to be true, then we can learn. Step number three, be willing to learn. We all have our inherent biases. We just do. And, and there's, nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. There's just something um, there, that's just a shortcoming. But that's okay because we all have them, okay? So we don't need to throw stones at each other. We just need to be willing to learn. For example, I don't know if you were watching recently, I had a guest live on here, and uh, he used a term, cotton picking. You know, that cotton picking, da da da, da you know. And I, I reacted, I was like, whoa, you need to not say that. And he asked me afterwards, um, what, what's wrong with that? And he said, my dad, now this guy's white, as white as me, right? This guy said, my dad grew up picking cotton. So did my granddad. What, what, what's the deal there? And I said, okay, uh, okay, fully recognize and admit that a lot of white people pick cotton. But because slavery was built around the cotton trade in our country, and slaves were forced to pick cotton from a very early age, from sunup to sundown, and treated like animals, the connotation of that phrase, it just it seeps into racism. Now, he didn't mean it. He, he, he didn't even register with him because of his family history picking cotton, you know. But those are the kinds of things, those areas where you go, okay, I, I, I don't, maybe I don't even fully see it. But would that be an improvement for me to drop that phrase? Yeah, yeah, it would be. Now, uh, obviously that can go too far. Um, my um, I had a relative, let's say, uh, not my parents, just draw that line right there. I had a relative who was a good Southern Democrat, and there were two things that she believed that she would not budge from. Even though she was against abortion and high taxes and things like that, she said, I will never vote for a Republican. That's the rich man's party. Wouldn't budge from that. The other thing she wouldn't budge from is that I think black people are fine. They just need to stay on their side of town. Blew my mind. I, uh, that was the first really close overt racism that I'd ever encountered. And it wasn't, it wasn't someone that I loved, you know. Um, there was not a willingness to, to learn. Um, there were some things that she needed to drop in her thinking, you know, on these smaller issues, using a phrase here, I don't mean the offensive words, I mean, just these, these small things, and, and, you know, and it's, it's, okay, here's another good example, recently, the whole blackface thing has come up, now, I always thought, you know, if you're doing the whole menstrual show, that's not cool, but if it's Halloween, and you're going as Michael Jackson, or you're wearing a Barack Obama mask, because you like him, is that offensive? Well, apparently, to some, it is. Uh, I don't. I don't see it. If if I'm dressing up as a character, and my skin color doesn't match, you know, if that character is green, I'm going to go with green paint. If that character's 
yellow. I'm going to go with yellow paint. If they're going to, if that character is black, I'm going to go with black paint. I just, to me, it's just costumes. And a lot of times it can be honoring someone. Uh, I mean, if it's denigrating, obviously that's very obviously wrong. But I thought, can you not honor someone with a Halloween costume and use dark makeup? Apparently no. Well, it doesn't matter that I don't see it. You just don't do it. You just go, you know what? Even if I don't quite get it, I'm not going to do it because I'm going to be extra sensitive. That's where we can learn. We can improve. And that takes humility. Even if you are right or think you're right, you go, I'm going to humble myself and take that extra step in the name of advancing peace and love and getting rid of the discrimination based on skin color. So there's a lot we can do. Recognize it's a problem. Look for common ground with people. Be willing to learn. Now this is probably, uh, oh, by the way, he referenced that, that hug. There's the picture right there. And this is actually a very interesting story. So there was uh, a rally, after, the first one after Charlottesville, uh, where... Richard Spencer was speaking, and he's he's an idiot, okay? He's a racist. So he's speaking, so all these people show up, and they're going to protest. And it is quite the group of protesters. And then, of course, you you do that, and you just trot out your, your handful of white supremacists. I didn't know these people really existed. I mean, they're in the margins. They're in the fringe. There was a movie years ago called American History X where you saw some of that. Uh, and, and I was like, really? That's still around? Yeah, it's still around. It's, it's always going to be around, okay? Um, that's no excuse for it. We should continue to fight it. But I'm just saying, it's, there's going to be idiots. So how do you handle it? Well, that guy that's being hugged there, the white guy, the white supremacist guy, there's another clip where he's getting punched in the face, which happened first. Then this other guy comes up, and he's saying, why do you hate me? Why do you hate me? Well, this black guy, his dad is a bishop. And he said later, you know what? I felt like I could have punched him right there because the white guy was just trying to stare him down. Um, he said, I, I, I could have punched him, but I felt like what he needed was love. And so I asked him, can I hug him? Because when we said, why do you hate me? The guy had no answer. There's no good answer. There is no good answer. There is no answer. <laughs> he said, can I... I, can I hug you? Can I hug you? And finally the guy let him hug him. I thought that was awesome, right? But why should it be the burden of the oppressed to be the bigger person? Now, I applaud them. As Christians, we should always be the, the bigger person, the better person, the one who extends love. But, man, come on. And, and again, I, I recognize that the church is doing great in this area for the most part, for the 90-whatever high percentage part. I just want to encourage us. We can do better. We can keep pressing. We can, we can learn. We can honor people. We can make more strides in this area. Another clip from Miles, and then I'm going to ask you to help me with something. People put themselves in groups, and your in-group are the people who are like you, and your out-group are people who are not like you. And it, it could be like you in color, it could be like you in profession, mm -hmm. it could be like you in gender. And when you are in your in-group, you experience in-group bias. People who are like you give you better treatment than people who are not like you, because mm -hmm. you don't know the people who are not like you. And so someone said to me, you know, you need to get over this race thing. And I said, you probably spend a lot of your time in your in-group, mm -hmm. surrounded by people who are like you, who think like you, who give you the benefit of the doubt. You're probably not ever around too often people who are not like you, who are suspicious of you, because mm -hmm. they don't know you. So I challenge this person, I challenge six people, to go someplace where they would be the only white person to experience what it likes to be a minority. Because minorities are around people other, other than them all the time. Right. And so four went and two did not. <laughs> uh, one lady went to a, a black church, another guy went to a barbershop. Um, and two guys didn't do it at all. They were scared. They literally said, I'm not doing it. I, I can't run fast. I don't, <laughs> you know, I, it's going to be dangerous. And, and, it, and it was it was really kind of embarrassing. Yeah. Um, 
but it was it was to feel what it's like to be the other because right. what happens when you're around people who uh, are not like you you're less comfortable and you're and you're less you're not treated as well in general as if you were pe or being around people who are like you. Or, or sometimes you just, because of your own lack of comfort, you think you're not exactly. treated as well. Your mind starts to play games with you. They did this because of this. Right. They looked at me and were thinking this. We could never know that. Yeah. And, and so now you know what it's like to be on the other side. Mm -hmm. And imagine living like that every single yeah. day, yeah. going to work every single day, and everywhere you go, you're the other. Uh -huh. What that will do to you, mm -hmm. the stress of that. Yeah. Um, and so that was an important, important point and experience. And in the book, I have a list of questions these people asked, answered, like what did they feel like when they went? Mm -hmm. What did they learn? But the biggest question for them was, did what you fear would happen, happen? <laughs> All of them said no. Mm -hmm. Had that ever happened to you in your life? No. So here's this fear that these people are gonna do something to me that's never happened to them and it didn't happen to them, but it's still a fear. Mm -hmm. Uh, we all have a social narrative, a story through which we see the world, and it's based on how we were brought up and what we were taught, like you were told, here's these words to say. Mm -hmm. Well, when we're young, we learn things about people, but it's not always true. It's, a lot of times it's based on rumor or one experience. And so we have this view of the world, and this book is gonna help people step back yeah. and say, how do I really need to see people the way God sees them yeah. and honor the, the, the humanness and the value of their humanity the way God would want me to do that. All right, I like that experiment. I enjoyed that experiment. That's a great part of the book, by the way. It goes into more detail. Uh, that, in case you're coming in late, that is the author of this book, The Third Option, Miles McPherson, uh, pastor in San Diego. You see that forward by Drew Brees. Uh, Miles played four years in the NFL. So if you want to get deeper into this, that's a great resource. Um, the clip before that one, by the way, he, he drew a line between being racist and being racially offensive. And I think that's a huge point because you, you, you can be not racist, but do something or say something that offends someone of another race, you know, unintentionally, just out of ignorance. Um, and that comes from just, just being from a different group. You know, that's not your in group. I, here's a little illustration for you. Now, I'm going to need some participation, so let me... All right. You can probably just see one word there. Okay. What what do you see when you look at this coffee cup? I'm going to wait. I'm going to... This is an illustration, by the way, that I stole from Pastor Robert Morris at Gateway Church. And uh, so I'm going to repeat it here, just slightly modified. Um what do you what do you see when you look at this coffee mug? And I'm gonna wait. Somebody out there is gonna answer me. <laughs> Come on, Esther. Come on, Sherry. Robert, Dave. By the way, Dave says that you know what happens when you get offended? You move on. And I'm gonna address that. Thank you, Sherry. You see the word true. Well, guess what? I don't see that at all. I see the words harvest house. It's a mug from a pub publisher. Um, I see Harvest House. You don't see that, do you? But we're both looking at the same coffee mug, right? We have to take the time to go around an issue, to see things from other people's perspectives, because we could be looking at the same thing. We're both looking at the same coffee mug. You see True and a little green line and stuff. I see Harvest House and an H. It says right there, Harvest House, see? We have to be willing to step out of our comfort zones. And that's my next point. Step out. Like the experiment that Miles talks about, going and getting your hair cut if you're white, going to an all-black barbershop and getting your hair cut. It'll, it'll get you past a lot of assumptions that you have. It'll also kind of put the shoe on the other foot because especially if, okay, if you look, if you're white and you live in a predominantly white area, you're the majority you probably don't even think about this most of the time. But when you are in, I've been in places where I am the only white guy in sight, whether it's another country or 
certain parts of Los Angeles, uh, San Francisco, uh, and South Dallas. I've been in areas where all of a sudden I got uncomfortable because of the color of my skin. And that starts to play with your mind. And most of what's going on just isn't true. But that's how it feels for uh, the, the lone minority at work, right? And we don't, again, we don't think of this because we don't, we're not forced to go around the other side of the coffee cup and see what it says. Um, and, and what it does is it's, it just leaves us a little short in learning to, in dealing with something. Uh, our perspective is just a little too narrow sometimes. Uh, and it's not intentional. It's just, it's just the way it is. But we can overcome that by taking the time to go around and see things from another person's perspective. Tremendously helpful. That's a proactive step. That's something we can do that will help to overcome the situation. Now, a point made from Dave out there on Facebook talking about being offended. What happens when you get offended? Nothing, just move on. Well, let, me, let me back up. There's two parts to offense. There is giving offense and there is taking offense. It is a two-person transaction because you're right, Dave, in the sense that People can hand out offense to me all day long, and if I refuse to take it, I'm not offended. Flip side of that is, people are going to be handing them out offense all day long. It's up to you whether you want to take it. What I'm suggesting in this idea of racism, because God knows there seems to be hands reaching in your pocket trying to find some racism these days, right? And then there's other ones that seem to be just offensive. They're just offensive. They are. As Christians, don't take it. Don't take the offense. Don't take it. But also, learn how to not give it. And I know you're probably thinking, well, I don't, I don't, I don't use this word. I don't do this. I don't do this. I'm not giving it. I'm just trying to stretch us here a little bit and say sometimes we just don't see the other side of the coffee cup. Um, sometimes we stay in our in-group uh, we don't know what it's like to be outside of, of that, outside of our comfort zone. Um, you know, we can we can take some steps. We can we can go out and kind of push the boundaries, and that's helpful. That's what being a leader is about. It's not just sitting back and letting everyone else handle it. It's saying, you know what, I'm going to take that step. You know, I got that neighbor who's the only minority on my street. If you live in certain areas, right? Maybe you're in that area where the only minority is the only white guy. And you know what? This applies both ways. But maybe you go, okay, um, I'm going to go over and, and just make a point, introduce myself, say hi, tell them if there's anything you need. I'm here. I live over there. My name is so-and-so. It just creates a comfort for, for people, you know? Um, again, you don't have to patronize people. You can just be Christ-like. That's always a good thing. Always a good thing. Last thing, uh, and this goes, what I asked Miles before he responded to this is, what do you do with those people who say, you are not me, okay, you will never understand? They say to a man, you're not a woman, you'll never, never understand. They say to a white guy, you're not black, you'll never understand. They say to a, a white guy, you're not Hispanic, you were born in this country, You'll never understand. Um, whatever it is, and you kind of you're kind of left speechless because you're like, okay, yeah, I am a white guy who was born in America. So, and then that, do you believe what they just said? So I can never understand, which paralyzes you. Let me tell you, that's a lie. It's a lie. You can never be someone else, but there are things you can do. Miles McPherson addresses that. I could never understand what it means to have a baby. Right. That's a fact. I'm not a woman. I'll never have a baby. However, it doesn't mean I can't love women. It doesn't mean I can't serve women. It doesn't mean I can't learn from women. Mm -hmm. it doesn't mean I can't partner with women. There's so many other things to do. And me, I don't need to have, to be pregnant nine months and to give birth to a baby and go through labor in order to have empathy for a woman and understand things about a woman. 
Um, I'll never understand what it means to be a white man because I'm not. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what that means. So what's the point? <laughs> the point is that I have something to learn from you yeah. as you have something to learn from me. Right. Your job is not to be me. Right. Your, and my job is not to be you. But can we learn from each other and encourage each other in things we don't know? Uh, that's why we need each other more than ever is right. because we need to share each other's experiences with each other. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, you're not, you, you'll never know what it's like to play, play in the NFL because you haven't played in the NFL. Right. But that doesn't mean you can't, I can't share with you some of those experiences that yeah. you can't enjoy it. And that's my last point as we lead in this issue of getting rid of racism in our neighborhoods, in our families, in our countries. Do what you can do. I don't have to have babies to be able to love my wife, to serve my wife, to honor my wife, to, to empathize with her, to, to understand as much as I can. I can't be her, but I can be a lot for her. I can be a lot of good things to her. I will never be Hispanic. I'll never be Asian. I'll never be DNA tests. Uh, debunked some <laughs> the ideas that I might have had some Native American in me, zero, right? It's all almost all Irish. So I will never be these other things when it comes to skin color. And that's okay. I can still love, respect, serve, do something, right? Um, do what you can do because I think you'll find that the, the color barrier is a little bit of Satan's paper wall. It comes down really quick in the face of Christ's love. So I hope this is something that has helped just get you thinking, maybe given you some action items, uh, taken away some fear, uh, and freed you to be who Christ created you to be in him. That's an ambassador for him to all the nations, to all the people groups. Don't fear messing up, go in love, and we can stamp out as much as it's possible to stamp out anything. We can fight racism. If this has helped you, uh, share it. These are the places you can see it. If you're not seeing it, I'm actually uh, welcoming the, the Light Source audience in the replay. If you want to be live with us right here, um, and we'll do this Monday through Friday, 12 noon Central Time, Texas Time. Oh, sorry about the mic hit. Texas Time. <laughs> so, um, thank you, Diana. Uh, by the way, Diana, I think, was the only one that saw the war. Yeah, she's the only one that saw both words on this one, grow true. The green's a little faint. Um, Esther, all of you guys, appreciate you guys. Um, I, I'm really trying to just kind of change the way that we reach out to the culture and spread the gospel, spread Christ's love and truth, grace and truth. Um, I try to start with grace and get to the truth. That well, sounds kind of bad. Let me rephrase that. I'll rewrite, I'll rewrite that little line and, and make that one better. But full, fully grace, fully truth. That's how Christ came. So that's how we should seek to, to go. But have a good weekend. I will see you guys on Monday. And uh, as always... Thank you for being a part of Life Today Live. I love the chat aspect of it and getting your input and you guys taking part in this. So I will see you again. Well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead. But it really doesn't matter with me now. Because I've been to the mountain.